In this era of Hollywood rebooting, remaking, reimagining, well, basically anything that ever had a fan base, it's really hard to not feel discouraged because most of it has been kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh yeah, shit. So when the news came out that Disney and Marvel were doing a revival of X-Men, the animated series that would pick up where that show left off all those years ago, I felt sick to my stomach. Now, you have to understand, okay? I owe my X-Men fandom in large part to two things. The Dark Phoenix Saga graphic novel, which I read as a kid at summer camp, and X-Men the Animated Series. If you weren't around back then, you don't understand what a phenomenon that show was. It was dark, thought-provoking, had mature themes, smart writing, serialized stories, which at the time was a revolutionary thing for a cartoon. This thing inspired the fandom of an entire generation of fans. It was lightning in a bottle, the likes of which young me had never experienced before. For several years, my entire week revolved around Saturday morning when Fox Kids would air a new episode. I recorded every one on VHS. I watched them over and over. The Dark Phoenix story is what sparked my interest, but X-Men the Animated Series is what made me a fan for life. It got me into the comics, which spun off into interest in other characters and titles and stuff. I wouldn't be the fan of geeky type things that I am today without X-Men the Animated Series. That show means a lot to me. So when they announced X-Men 97, even though I would have loved nothing more than for it to be great, every molecule in my body was screaming, just don't do it. I just had absolutely no faith that current year Marvel and Disney were going to get this right. I figured they'd ruin it just like they've ruined all their other IPs, just like they've ruined the comics. I was dreading it. Then information started trickling in, and it was a mixed bag. The creators of the original show were going to be involved. That's good. They got a bunch of the original voice cast to come back. That's good. The showrunner announced that if people wanted to work on this show, it was imperative that they be fans of the original. That's good. They were recreating actual panels of the classic Jim Lee art from back in the 90s. Okay, you got my attention with that stuff. They release a trailer. It's got the theme song, the action, the characters, the fan servicey moments. It all looks promising, but then things start going awry. The showrunner talks about how he was bringing his perspective as a gay black man to the writing process, and that's a big red flag if you remember what happened the last time the writers of a Marvel show decided to write about themselves instead of the source material. I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> They announced that Morph was going to be non-binary now, which I don't even have a problem with. Morph was created for the cartoon, so it's not like you're violating canon by changing him. He's the one character you can do that with. And they never pinned down which team Morph played for back in the 90s anyway, so if you want Morph to be whatever, then fine, I don't care about that. But in the past, this would have been done subtly, because shapeshifting can be seen as a metaphor for fluid such and such. But now they just current year this shit and use it to brag about how woke they are, and then they act surprised when fans take issue with it. Allow me to clarify, okay? It's not that fans missed the point of the original show. The original show wouldn't have thrown itself a parade to announce a character's gender identity for social media points. If you want to do this with Morph, so be it. But the right way to do it would have been to not make a big thing out of this and just let Morph organically be whatever he's gonna be. Then there's some weird shit going on with the cast. Some of the original voice actors are back, but not all of them are playing the same characters. Like, the Jubilee actress is back, but she's not voicing Jubilee anymore. Now she's voicing someone else. You know, because the ethnicities have to match now. All that bullshit. And if that's not stupid enough, Chris Potter is back too, but he's not voicing Gambit anymore. Now he's voicing Cable. So he's not white enough to voice Gambit, but he's white enough to voice Cable? Both characters are white! Why did you change that? What the f*** is going on here? So now the red flags are piling up. And then, just a few days before the premiere, Disney makes a big production of firing the showrunner. At the time I'm recording this, we don't really know why, but the rumor is Disney wasn't thrilled about this guy having an OnlyFans account and didn't want to be associated with whatever he was putting on there. Big black dick! Hmm. Seems kind of homophobic, Disney. 
Maybe it was you who missed the point of the original show. And they also said that he was difficult to work with or something. Who the hell knows what it was? But at any rate, losing your showrunner at this stage of the game, probably not a sign that your show is running smoothly. So bottom line, there were reasons to be optimistic and there were reasons to not be. I didn't know what the hell to think and I was feeling nothing but anxiety when the premiere came around. Short version? It hits a lot of nostalgia buttons. There's a ton of cool Easter eggs. They do a really good job aping the animation style of the old show, so it looks kind of retro, but in a good way. It gets a lot of surface level details right, enough that plenty of fans of the original series will be fooled by all the shiny things on display. But if you peel the layers back and look closer, all the warning signs are there that if the writing has not already dropped off a cliff, and that's very debatable, it's going to, and sooner than you think would be my guess. You want the long version? Here we go. Hold on to your butts. After a really goddamn good shot-for-shot -shot recreation of the iconic intro title sequence, the show begins about a year after the OG series ended. During that time, some things have changed. Xavier has been declared dead. Whether he's really dead or if he's still alive off in the Shi'ar Empire with Lalandra like when we left him, we don't know yet, but he's legally deceased. Also, Bishop has come back from the future again, and he's on the team now as a full-time member. That's a weird thing to skip over. I'm a Assuming they'll cover how it happened in flashbacks at some point, but right now there's too much other stuff going on, which looks like it may be an issue for a while. We begin with the Friends of Humanity, because those dipshits are still a thing, who are packing some kind of retrofitted Sentinel weapons, and it's anyone's guess how they got them. Maybe they reverse engineered this stuff from Sentinel wreckage they got their hands on, we don't know. And they've kidnapped Roberto da Costa, Sunspot. You may recall a big fuss that was made about him recently on account of the actor being the right nationality and the right ethnicity to voice Sunspot, but not the right skin color. Funny how Marvel didn't just change the color of the character to fit the actor like they've done in the past when they cast a black actor to voice a white character. You see how fucking stupid this is? Whatever. They have some mysterious buyer paying 10 grand a head for captured mutants. No info on who that is, but given the number of storylines they're going to be throwing at us, it could be anybody. The lead bad guy here has three claw mark scars on his face. You can fill in the blanks on that one. So they try to put the fear of God in Roberto for a minute, and then boom, in comes the cavalry. Storm, Bishop, and Cyclops. The action? Really good. I got no complaints. And something noticeable right off the bat. Someone this premiere really does right right by is Cyclops. He's still a stick in the mud like he always was, but there was definitely an effort to make him cooler and more relatable. I never liked Cyclops that much back in the old show. He was too much of a wet blanket, but this is a Cyclops I can get on board with. The way he takes charge and uses his powers in creative ways and fights like a badass, this Cyclops says LEADER GUY in all caps and I like it. And the new voice actor sounds exactly like the old one. I couldn't even tell it was a different guy. Later, at the mansion, Cyclops is giving... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My babies. Gambit and Rogue. Man, hearing Lenore Zan voicing Rogue again brings me so much joy. You have no idea. He's given them the business because they bailed on the rescue mission figuring the others had it covered. That raised an eyebrow with me, and it's something I noticed a lot in these two episodes. The characters are mostly the same, but a lot of them seem just a tiny bit off. Like a fanfic writer trying to copy the style of their favorite author, but can't quite get the voice to match. And in some cases, it felt like we're chalking that up to character development from the original show being walked back. If they knew somebody needed help, Gambit and Rogue would have gone on the mission. Gambit might need a little convincing, but he would go. By the way, if you're recasting Gambit's voice actor, it's still stupid, but AJ Lacasio is a great f***ing choice. And Jennifer Hale as Jean Grey? Big thumbs up on that too. Jean is heavily pregnant. Yeah. Yeah, they skipped over a lot. Slow burn storytelling is not really a thing here, and I don't think it's gonna be to the show's benefit. Morph comes in, looking like Xavier to mess with Cyclops as only he can, and they've changed Morph's character design, so now his normal form looks like he did in the Age of Apocalypse comics. I don't mind the change, I just wish they would explain it, and they don't. But character-wise, he feels like Morph. Roberto wakes up, and they have a talk with him. I like that Jubilee actually looks Chinese now. The new actress is fine. 
fine, unnecessary, but fine. And Beast is pitch perfect. They can't let Roberto leave yet. They need to figure out where the Sentinel tech came from first. And in the meantime, it's not really safe for him out there. So Berto wonders if there's anything to do in this place and instantly regrets it. Jubilee gets to play Welcome Wagon and shows off the Danger Room, where Berto meets Wolverine in the most traumatizing way a kid could meet him. Callbacks. There's a bunch of parallels to how Jubilee met the X-Men back in Night of the Sentinels. This was cool. He also sees a holographic Magneto in there who looks like he has the face of a trans woman. I swear to God, they put lip gloss on him. And unfortunately, that's not my biggest complaint about Magneto in this premiere. Cut to Xavier's office where there's a big portrait of the original five X-Men. Cool Easter egg. The thing is, it's wrong. In the original series, I'm going to be saying that a lot, they didn't meet Angel until many years later. They met him for the first time in that show, so he shouldn't be in that picture. To be fair, the old series did have a lot of continuity gaffes. They couldn't keep this stuff consistent either, so that's nothing new, but it's worth pointing out, I think. Scott and Jean are on a video call with Val Cooper from the comics. I guess she's their government contact or something. That's cool. They're discussing where the Sentinel tech could have come from, and maybe it came from Bolivar Trask, but that wouldn't really make sense considering where he was the last time we saw him. How he would even get the resources to make new Sentinels is pretty dubious, and just as important to me as the how is the why. They reference the events of the season one finale of the old show here, which I got a big kick out of. I rewatched that episode so many times as a kid, you have no idea. Scott's stressing out about a lot of things, all stemming from Xavier being declared dead recently. They do a little reminiscing about when they were kids in this place, and Jean floats the idea that with the baby coming, maybe they ought to think about taking a break from the X-Men. Makes sense. What would the mansion getting attacked or blown up every other week. That is no place for a baby. But Scott is aghast at the very idea, which is kind of a big f you to Storm if he doesn't think she'd be up to leading the team with him gone. Just saying. But you know what? This was one of the better Scott Jean scenes in the franchise. They're a cute couple here, and that's coming from a guy who's never really cared about them as a couple. I'll take Scott with Emma Frost 10 times out of 10. But hey, a good scene is a good scene. Kudos. A basketball smashes through the window. The others are doing stuff on the court. Apparently, Wolverine scared Roberto off. I can't imagine how that happened. So Scott has to order him to go find the kid, and Wolverine gets pissed. He doesn't like being bossed around. Again, the character's are a little weird. Wolverine wouldn't need to be ordered to go find a missing kid. He would just go. Also, the Scott Logan animosity, which had been mostly addressed by the end of the old series, has been cranked back up. There is a reason for it, but I don't like the idea of retreading old ground. It feels like we've just erased a lot of Wolverine's development so they could just do it over again. It's very strange. They track Roberto down to some seedy looking rave in the city, and we get some character here. Gambit and Rogue go off by themselves. I like this so far. There's sort of an unspoken acknowledgement between them that they're a thing, even though they can't do anything about it. Their body language is very flirty. There's hand holding. It's sweet, but Rogue is melancholy watching everybody else in the club get physical. This all tracks with where we left off with them in the old show, but oh man, is there gonna be a big monkey wrench thrown at them later. Morph messes with Logan about the Jean thing, changing into Jean, taunting him about how happy her and Scott are, which seems kind of mean, actually. And Logan says the reason he's so pissed off is because Jean's thinking of leaving. Jubilee finds Roberto when they dance together. They start flirting a little bit, and the comics purist in me completely noped out at this. I like the colors here a lot, though. Jubilee's powers make it look really pretty. But that's not exactly the smartest thing to do if you want to keep a low profile so the mutant hunt hate group doesn't find you. The Friends of Humanity walk in, and then the X-Men scare them away off screen. I mean it, they just walk up to Jubilee and Roberto afterward with the Sentinel tech they took off these assholes. Because why would people want to see a fight scene, right? That's not interesting at all. I would have preferred that to this canon-violating Jubilee sunspot thing, which feels so weird and random to me. A new mutant and a Gen Xer? No thank you, that's just icky. More interesting to me is the others go into a prison where Henry Gyrick has been since assassinating Xavier in the series finale of the old show. They think he might know something about the Sentinel tech since he worked with Trask back in the day. There's a mention of how what he did to Xavier has increased sympathy for mutants, but we haven't seen that at all. Gyrick speechifies for a minute so the writers can throw in some current year lingo and make him less of a character and more of a one-dimensional, hateful, spiteful bigot. And yeah, he 
he is. Garrick's always been a piece of shit, but subtlety and nuance aren't really a thing anymore with today's writers, so they really hammer that nail hard here. Even with the promise of 10 years off his sentence, Garrick's not talking, so Scott's like, whatever, don't say I didn't warn you. Wife, do the thing. And Gene reads his mind. They could have just done that in the first place, so this felt kind of unnecessary, but I like Scott being more fun like this, and I like having the scene to tie this back to the original, especially since the writers are playing fast and loose with continuity. Jean goes inside Gyrick's head, and she finds out that Trask secretly had a redundant backup master mold for all these years, which does not track at all if you think about it. Also, there's some nightmare fuel about the baby, and a giant graveyard, and some weird ghost thing who's apologizing for something. No idea what that's about. It's very abstract. I'm not sure why Jean couldn't just zero in on the thoughts she was looking for. The visuals are cool, though. So the team flies off in the Blackbird to somewhere, only to very quickly get shot out of the sky by sentinels. The flyers catch the non-flyers, but Cyclops doesn't need to be caught. He goes into free fall and breaks his own fall with his optic blast like an absolute boss. That was f***ing cool. However else I may feel about these episodes, Cyclops has gotten a deserved upgrade. They land in a big junkyard somewhere and finally come face to face with their old buddy Bolivar Trask, who's got a brand new master mold raring to go. Unfortunately, Trask has gotten the same muties equal evil muahahaha treatment that Gyrick received. He's not really a character with history anymore, because if you think about that history in the series, this show is the continuation of, this doesn't make sense. Altogether now, in, in the, the original, original show, show, Master Mold grew so far beyond Bolivar's control that it nearly got him killed multiple times. Now, Trask is a bad guy, but in the final decision, he did seem to realize that he'd royally f***ed up and even nearly sacrificed himself trying to destroy Master Mold. This is all my fault. I thought I was saving the world from mutants. Now I've created something much worse, something truly inhuman. And now you're telling me that he's been sitting on another master mold this whole time and just can't wait to roll it out and pick up where he left off like the final decision never happened? No. No, I'm sorry, I just don't buy it. Those dots don't connect. He can still hate mutants, but that character who went through all that stuff would not do this. But the episode needs a climax, so here we are. And then we get easily the best scene in this premiere. The X-Men versus the Sentinels in a direct callback to Night of the Sentinels all the way back in 1992, except this time the X-Men kick their f***ing asses. Did they set it up well? Not really. Was it transparent nostalgia bait? Yeah. But who gives a shit? The theme song kicks in, the X-Men leap into action, and suddenly I'm a little kid again, fangasming like a maniac. I loved every second of this fight. And it all builds up to Storm dropping the mic in one of those ultimate epic moments of badassitude and putting an end to this by obliterating all the Sentinels with a giant f***ing tornado. Which, for some reason, doesn't touch the X-Men even though they're right next to the Sentinels. That is not how tornadoes work. It was at this moment that we officially passed the high point of the premiere, and now we're gonna be heading mostly downhill. Master Mold's about to enter the fray, and that's when we get the clip of Gambit charging up Wolverine's claws that everybody was flipping out over. And yeah, it's cool as hell, but when Gambit charges something, it explodes. Wolverine's claws are attached to his body, so... Wouldn't this just blow Logan's arms off? Sure, you wanted to create a viral moment, mission accomplished. But if you just think about it for a second, the gears stop turning. It looks totally badass, but it really shouldn't work. But it does somehow, and <laughs> off goes the head. Considering the absolute hell the X-Men went through to defeat Master Mold the first time around, that felt way too easy. And then they just assume the danger is over, even though we know from the season four episode Courage that Master Mold's head can function independent of its body. So maybe don't leave the head lying around. Maybe destroy it before you leave. Yeah, I'm sure this won't come back to haunt you. 
Idiots. Val Cooper's people show up just after the nick of time. Cyclops gives the credit to his team. Good on you, Psych. Up in the bell tower at the mansion, Jubilee gives Roberto a version of the speech that Storm gave to her back in the day when she first met these people. Nice full circle moment there. They do a little more flirting. I'm not gonna get used to that in a hurry. He gives Jubilee his card, which is Gambit shtick. Get your own gimmick, bro. And then Roberto just disappears and we don't see him again this week. Weird. Minus the flirting, I like this. I like Jubilee in a position where she's the X-Man helping some other newbie now. If you watched back in the 90s, this moment is gonna mean something to you. Good for Jubilee, that's cool. Our girl is growing up. So Scott sort of apologizes to everyone for being a bit of a tool bag lately, admits he was putting a lot of pressure on himself to carry on Xavier's dream, but now he's realized that the dream doesn't need him. And it seems like he's about to announce that him and Jean are leaving, which has Jubilee wondering who the heck is gonna leave the team with them gone when Storm is standing two feet away looking right at her. Another really weird F you to Storm. Where is this coming from? Beats me. But suddenly the intruder alert goes off. They race to Xavier's office and who do they find there but Magneto who produces Xavier's will and announces that Charles left everything to him. Bitch, please. <laughs> and that raises all sorts of questions, not many of which will be answered in episode two. It's also a really big F.U. to Scott, so neither of the X-Men's leaders came out of this one unscathed. So... After all these years, finally having this show back that was such a big part of my childhood, how was it? That's complicated. It's better than I expected, but there are caveats. I like it aesthetically, I like the music, the action was great, it leaned hard on nostalgia and that was not lost on me, the new voice actors are terrific, I'm not even mad about the Gambit recasting, I just thought it was weird. And I really do love seeing these characters again. I love it. The writing has issues. The story can actually be picked apart quite easily. Some of the characterizations are a little bit awkward, enough so that I can look at several people and think, they wouldn't do this. And while it does feel like the people who made it love the original show, it seems as if they're picking and choosing which parts are canon and which parts they want to ignore. And I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Either it's all canon or none of it is. And if there's parts in there that you don't want, then don't do a continuation just make a new show. Also, it felt like it was trying to cram in too much stuff all at once. It's mainly just a bunch of little things right now, but if you've been paying attention for the last few years on this channel, you know that little things have a habit of turning into big things. And even though I did like this for the most part, it only takes until episode two for the cracks to really start to form. Hey guys, me from the Editing Dungeon here. I was originally going to cover the two-part premiere all in one video, but it just got way too long and I wasn't going to be able to finish it without needing to sleep first. So, slight change of plans. I'm cutting it here and I'll cover episode two in a separate video. I already shot it, I just need to finish editing, so look for that one either tomorrow or the day after. Rest assured, I had a lot to say because... Wow. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching part one of this X-Men 97 premiere review. While you're here, ding that bell icon and follow my social media so you can always be notified when I upload new stuff. The links are down there. And don't forget to do all the other YouTube things. Hit that thumbs up, share the video, subscribe if you haven't already, make sure you're still subscribed, and I'll be back with part two in just a little bit. Stay tuned for that, take care, and I'll see you soon.